As the world's attention turns to events in Eastern Europe, rising tensions between the world's nuclear superpowers is once again raising the specter of the Cold War. And just as in the Cold War, this conflict too brings with it the prospect of nuclear warfare. This is the GRTV Backgrounder on Global Research TV. Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com reporting for Global Research TV in downtown Hiroshima, Japan, in the Peace Memorial Park in front of the A-bomb dome that marks the hypocenter of the blast that tore through this city 69 years ago, claiming tens of thousands of lives in the blink of an eye, and tens of thousands of more through the ravages of radiation poisoning in the days, weeks, months, and years that followed. The Peace Park is a place of prayer and vigil, a place for quiet contemplation of the horrors of nuclear warfare. The silence punctuated only by the peals of the peace bell rung by those wishing for the abolition of nuclear warfare. But now, despite the best wishes of those here in the Peace Park and countless others around the world, the specter of nuclear warfare once again hangs over the globe. Last month's nuclear summit at The Hague saw the usual politicians spouting the usual platitudes about the need to reduce the threat of nuclear warfare. And at this uh, particular summit, we've seen such steps as uh, Belgium and Italy uh, completing the removal of their excess supplies of highly enriched uranium and pl uh, plutonium so that those supplies can be eliminated. Uh, in a major commitment, Japan announced that it will work with the United States to eliminate hundreds of kilograms of weapons usable nuclear material from one of their experimental reactors, which would be uh, enough for a dozen nuclear weapons. Uh, dozens of other nations have agreed to take specific steps uh, towards improving nuclear security in their own countries and to support uh, global efforts. But this was far from your average nuclear security summit. Tensions in Ukraine between Russia and the NATO powers provided a dramatic subtext to the meeting with the G7 powers meeting behind the scenes to expel Russia from the G8 and make the boldest steps yet in what is already being dubbed the New Cold War. And just as in the original Cold War, the threat of nuclear warfare between the great powers is the unspoken fear raised by the conflict. In line with the rising geopolitical friction, stories have begun to emerge that both sides have heightened their levels of nuclear readiness. NATO, for its part, has continued buildup of its European missile shield. In February, the USS Donald Cook arrived at Port in Rota, Spain to begin its deployment as part of the so-called Ballistic Missile Defense Plan. It is the first of four advanced destroyers that the US is deploying as part of the shield, which they say is aimed at defending the continent from the theoretical future threat of a theoretically nuclear-armed Iran. That these destroyers, and NATO's missile shield in general, is being deployed to counter a threat from Iran is not believed outside of narrow, America-centric propagandistic circles, however. <laughs> In truth, the term missile defense is a misnomer, as it is a universally acknowledged tenet of nuclear warfare doctrine that advanced missile defense systems are integral to escalation dominance, or the ability to engage in warfare at any level of violence, including nuclear warfare. And the threat that NATO envisions does not come from Iran, a nation that has never been shown to be pursuing nuclear weapons, let alone actually possessing them, but Russia, still the world's second nuclear superpower. This was made explicit in the last round of Russia-NATO missile shield consultations, started in Lisbon in 2010, and now officially suspended by the Pentagon in the wake of recent developments in Ukraine. The consultations launched on the premise that the two sides could work together on countering any supposed threat from outside Europe, had been deadlocked for years after Washington stonewalled Moscow's demands for a legal guarantee that their strike forces would not target Russia's deterrence capabilities. Meanwhile, Russia, for its part, is also ramping up the nuclear posturing. According to a new study by the Federation of American Scientists, Moscow deployed 25 new strategic nuclear launchers in the past six months, bringing its total of deployed launchers to 498, with 1,512 associated nuclear warheads. And just last Thursday, the Russian military held a massive three-day nuclear exercise involving 10,000 soldiers in its strategic missile forces. These developments seem light years removed from the feel-good rhetoric about nuclear disarmament that the UN Security Council was spouting at the beginning of the Obama presidency. 
The historic resolution we just adopted enshrines our shared commitment to the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. And it brings Security Council agreement on a broad framework for action to reduce nuclear dangers as we work toward that goal. It reflects the agenda I outlined in Prague and builds on a consensus that all nations have the right to peaceful nuclear energy, that nations with nuclear weapons have the responsibility to move toward disarmament, and those without them had the responsibility to forsake them. This rhetoric, of course, was always just that. Rhetoric. The U.S. government has never seriously considered giving up its nuclear stockpile, or even renouncing a first-use nuclear doctrine. As Dr. Yuki Tanaka of Hiroshima University explains, the Obama administration has not simply continued the aggressive Bush-era stance on America's nuclear arsenal, but actually extended it. Obama government's, uh, the the budget on nuclear weapons is far larger than the Bush, you know, the administration's, the budget for nuclear weapons. People don't think about it, you know, but people think, well, the Obama is, is because, you know, his announcement in, in Prague that, you know, uh, U.S. is going to abolish nuclear weapons in the future. It's not. Actually, uh, it was a reverse situation uh, because of the, um, the reduction of the actually nuclear missiles is not means that the reduction of the, the, the uh, abolishment of nuclear weapons because they are just uh, installing, you know, uh, uh, old nuclear we uh, uh, weapons in a storage, you know, they never, they, they haven't got rid of that. Uh, actually, they're spending a huge amount of money to maintain the uh, the the uh, nuclear weapons um, you know, stored, you know, um, uh, dismantled from the uh, uh, missiles, you know. And also, the, the Obama uh, government is spending a huge amount of money to not just the maintaining, but the um, the keeping that the, uh, the that nuclear weapons as long as possible, so-called you know extension of the uh, life uh, expe uh, expectancy of the nuclear weapons, a huge amount of money is spent for that. So the you can tell that the U.S. government is not giving up, or not actually moving towards the uh, reduction of nuclear weapons. In reality, the Obama administration has simply reaffirmed and even extended the existing U.S. nuclear policy, allowing for a first-strike, offensive nuclear war against its enemies. In its 2010 nuclear posture review, the U.S. government admitted that it reserves the right to wage a first-strike, offensive nuclear war, although it hoped to work toward the goal of one day setting policies to restrict nuclear deployment to defensive situations. The Obama administration's 2013 nuclear employment strategy document only reaffirms this. The 2010 Nuclear Posture Review established the administration's goal to set conditions that would allow the United States to safely adopt a policy of making deterrence of nuclear attack the sole purpose of U.S. nuclear weapons. Although we cannot adopt such a policy today, the new guidance reiterates the intention to work towards that goal over time. Increasing the risk is the development and deployment in recent years of a greater number of so-called tactical nuclear weapons, supposedly designed for battlefield use, to focus a nuclear attack on a pinpoint target. The B-6111 nuclear bunker buster, for example, has been envisioned as one weapon that could be deployed in a future attack on Iran's underground nuclear facilities. As the Union of Concerned Scientists pointed out in 2005, however, such a strike would invariably cause an uncontrollable radioactive fallout that could lead to hundreds of thousands of deaths throughout the region. If the United States used a single weapon with a one megaton yield against the Esfahan nuclear facility in Iran, for example, the deadly radioactive fallout would spread to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India. In this simulation, based on a model developed by the Pentagon, over three million people would be killed as a result of the attack and 35 million people would be exposed to significant cancer-causing radiation. The threat of nuclear warfare is not limited to the Middle Eastern or Eastern European theaters. The situation in East Asia, with nuclear-armed North Korea backed by nuclear-armed China increasingly coming into conflict with South Korea and its nuclear-armed U.S. military backers. 
As Professor Michelle Chosodovsky of the Center for Research on Globalization explained last year in a speech in Korea commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Korean armistice, the situation is exacerbated by the nuclear posture of the world global superpower, the United States. Now, if you read the newspapers in the United States or anywhere in the Western world, North Korea is the threat. And it's not only a threat locally, but it is a threat to the security of the United States. Now, if we put this in the broader perspective, there's a, what I call an asymmetry in nuclear weapons capabilities between the United States and, and, uh, and, uh, um, and North Korea. Um, they are, according to the most recent data, more than 5,000 U.S. warheads stockpiled and deployed. Not all of them are deployed. Out of those 5,000, there are more than 1,600 strategic nuclear warheads which are deployed, and there are another 500 so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Um, I should explain that a tactical nuclear weapon is called a mini-nuke, but they're not so small as what they appear to be. They have an explosive capacity between one-third and six time, times a Hiroshima bomb. There are another 500 of those. So what we have is 2,000, some over 2,000 nuclear bombs are currently targeted, and they are targeted against North Korea. They're also targeted against a number of other countries. Because you, in other words, it's, it's the principle of multiple targeting. So you have 2,000 nuclear weapons which are targeted and, um, and which are deployed okay, out of approximately 5,600, if I count the, the tactical nuclear weapons. So we're talking about an arsenal, a, a, a formidable arsenal. And, and uh, the question we have to ask ourselves, who is the military threat? Who is the threat? Where does the threat come from? From North Korea or from the United States of America? As tensions continue to rise, and as the policies allowing for the use of so-called strategic nuclear weapons continue to be hardwired into place, the goal of the abolition of nuclear warfare seems as far away today as it ever has. And for the citizens of Hiroshima, Japan, the dream of a nuclear-free world remains just that. A dream. Unrealized. In a fitful and restless sleep. Punctuated only by the solemn admonition of the peace bell, never again. Never again. For Global Research TV, this is James Corbett. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com. The Center for Research on Globalization depends on your support. To purchase a book or DVD, or to make a donation, please visit globalresearch.ca today.